I enjoy that song so much, Aaron, especially. And I think in that song, for me at least in the chorus, the emphatic word is own, with his own hand. God has not delegated his guidance for me and his interest in me to anyone, but he assumes that on himself and that responsibility. That's a beautiful song, and I appreciate you leading that as the others for the prayer that was offered, for the thoughts before the Lord's Lord's table that were so appropriate and so measured uh, for the occasion. We're, We're so grateful for that. And we hope that also this short moment will be a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. Well, let me start by asking you a question. What's God's name? What is God's name? Now, for a child, they might respond, God's name is God, G-O-D. Or his name is Jesus. Or his name is Christ. And in this respect, that's correct. These are accurate ways of saying what God's name is. But if you were to ask someone maybe living in the time of the, the Jews, the time of Christ, what is God's name? They might respond in some different ways. They might say, well, God's name is the Almighty. That's how he appeared and presented himself to Abraham. I am the Almighty. Or as he might appear to perhaps Hagar or Ishmael or others, he is the God who sees. Or for Abraham, he's the God who provides as well. But if you were to ask Moses, what is God's name? Moses himself asked God this question, what is your name? And if you remember the occasion there at the burning bush, when God said, Moses, go deliver my people from from Egypt. Remember the first question that Moses asked him was, well, when I go and I tell the people, what name do I give them? Who do I say is sending me to let them go? And God said, tell them I am has sent you. That word, I am, or that phrase, has often been translated to the name of God that we're used to seeing in a lot of different areas. The name Yahweh, or as early modern English speakers would have translated or pronounced that, Jehovah. These mean the same thing. This is an emphasis on the covenant name that God was giving his people. But you might also think of other names that God assumes in the scriptures. We might take, for example, the names Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Jesus, name above all names. And these are appropriate as well. If you're asked this question, though, to perhaps the ancient superstitious pagan, they might say, well, the name of a God or the name of any kind of spiritual being is some kind of special way of connecting your life and your personal presence at a moment with that God's or that being's presence. And that's why the superstitious idolater or pagan would hesitate before saying the name of a god or saying even the name of a demon or some kind of spirit because they would have viewed that as some kind of special invitation for that being to come and to be in their presence. And that might have some disastrous complications for them if they summon the wrong being by saying the wrong name. And so the idea of a name is a very complicated, multifaceted idea in Scripture. But there's another way in which the Scriptures speak of God's name, and that's the focus that we really want to bring this morning. It's the use of the word name like you might find in the Proverbs or in Ecclesiastes. A good name is to be chosen above riches. And the idea of one's name, meaning one's reputation, when you say a name, What do you think of that person? What do you associate with them? What have you come to know about them by their name? And we all are like that. We all have a reputation. And we all have a cloud of words and ideas and feelings that people have about us when our name is brought up. In some context or in some social circles, you might bring up someone's name. And you might think of hard worker or lazy. Or you might think of kindness, or you might think of selfishness, or you might associate them with a job that they do or a talent that they possess. Or maybe you hear a name, and maybe you associate that with someone else of that name that you knew long ago, and you have a kind of idea about what that name feels like. That's the sense in which we're speaking of God's name this morning. And that idea, that approach to God's name is all throughout the scriptures. And so what we want to do this morning then is to bring your attention to the fact or to remind you 
that God's name is one of the transcendent, ever-present themes throughout Scripture. And what we want to then look at this morning is how God thinks of His name, what God has done to establish His name. We want to think about God's reputation, and then toward the end of the lesson, we want to turn our focus to me and how I contribute to God's name and the responsibilities that God expects of me in contributing to his name and to his reputation. So what I want to do first is look at through the scriptures how God throughout the entire Bible has made an effort to make his name known. If you will, turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 5. In the period in the series of events surrounding the exodus from Egypt, this was a pivotal moment in God establishing his name. And if you go on and you read throughout the rest of the law of Moses, you read throughout the history, the prophets, the New Testament, God continually will go back to the exodus and say, this was the moment when I really stamped my name, my reputation upon the world. And if you begin tracing this theme throughout the Exodus, go over to chapter 5, when Moses first goes to the Pharaoh. In chapter 5 of Exodus, God has, uh, Moses has gone in before the Pharaoh, and he says in verse 1, Thus says the Lord, that is I am, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Pharaoh understood that when Moses said, thus says Yahweh, or I am God of Israel, let my people go. Pharaoh understood that what Moses was doing was identifying his God by name. And Pharaoh's response is, I don't know this name. I don't know this God. And because he did not know this God, he had no respect for him. And so he disdains and sets this God aside. Terrible mistake, Pharaoh. God then proceeds throughout the story in Exodus to give Pharaoh ten good reasons why he should listen to this God's voice. And what we see then, after Pharaoh has proclaimed his ignorance of who this God is, and anything associated with this God's reputation... Look over to chapter 15 then of Exodus. And while the body and the corpse of Pharaoh is bobbing in the Red Sea with his chariots and with his army, you see the Israelites proclaiming who this God is in chapter 15. Look in chapter 15 in verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord, I am. And spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And so you go on and you read the rest of this song of Moses and of the people of Israel. They are establishing this is who God is. And they are distinguishing them, him then from the rest of the gods that the nations would serve. They are proclaiming the name of God. And so it was crucial at this birth of the nation of Israel that both they and the nations understood who he was... And as Moses then is giving this covenant to the people, chapter 15 is that pivotal moment where God makes his name known to his covenant people. But you go forward and you look over with me to the book of Isaiah. What has happened in these verses and these chapters intervening is that Israel forgot the name of their God. Israel forgot who the Lord was. And there is now coming a time in Isaiah when the prophet has looked forward to the rejection and the destruction of the physical nation of Israel for a moment so that God would punish them for their breaking of the covenant. But in Isaiah 55, he's looking forward to the time in which he would redeem the nation. And this puts me in mind, too, of the excellent thoughts that Daniel brought before us Wednesday night of how the Lord invites the people in Isaiah 55 to come and remember what true spiritual liberty and satisfaction is. 
And what's the sum result? What's the exercise for? What's the aim of this entire business? It's in chapter 55 and verse 13. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So when he says this will be for a name, it's not that, oh, we're going to spell God's name differently now. Or we'll know him and call him something else. No, the idea here is what will establish who God is, what he is all about, and his character more than this. What do we come to learn about God from the restoration of the Jews back to Jerusalem, back to their land, and the erection of a new temple, and then ultimately the bringing in of the Messiah through this nation? What does that say about God? Is his patience his mercy to forgive and to redeem this nation and to take that which was merely an object of his wrath and turn that then into the instrument and the vessel of bringing a blessing to all nations through the seed of Abraham. That is a wonderful testimony to who God is, how he operates, and this establishes his name, the redemption of Israel. We come to learn so much about him and to be impressed by his character by this. But you see this ultimately culminating in the salvation that's offered in Jesus Christ. Let's turn over to John chapter 1. God makes his name known in the Exodus. God makes his name known in the redemption of Israel. And God makes his name known in the salvation that he has brought through his son. In John chapter 1, we read in verse 10. In John chapter 1 and verse 10, we read of Jesus. He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And now we understand better, after looking at these Old Testament scriptures, what it means to believe in the name of Christ. To believe in the name of Christ is not just to say, Oh, in response to a question of whether I believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. That's not what it means to believe in his name. To believe in his name is to believe in his name like the Pharaoh didn't believe in the name of God. Like the Israelites had failed to believe in the name of God and had to be reminded. What it means to believe in his name is to understand, to comprehend, and to embrace who God is and to cast your salvation and put it upon him and to trust in him for that. That's what it means to believe in his name. And that's what it means to be baptized into his name. Remember what Peter told the Jews on Pentecost? Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To be baptized into the name of Jesus is not a reference to, you have to say the incantation. you got to get the, the chant and the ritual right, and then God will check that off. No, to be baptized in his name is to say that I am doing this based upon the track record and the body of work and the reputation of what Jesus is and what he accomplished. And that I embrace that, and I am surrendering to that. That's what it means to be baptized in his name. We also see in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there's no under name, under heaven by which we must be saved. And again, it's not just if I chant the right letters and I make the right sound that I receive salvation. And if I don't say that passcode, then I'm not in. No, the idea there is there is no other name. No one else has done what Christ has done to bring about our salvation. He makes his name known. But there's also a moment when we see the summation of the eternal plan brought up into the name of who the Lord is. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 15. This brings us full circle with the song of Moses from the Red Sea crossing. In Revelation chapter 15, and the very act of God expressing and executing his eternal plan, we see a glimpse into the praise that is deserved by God as he is executing his plan. In Revelation 15, notice verse 3. It says, 
they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So what we see then is this picture that in the very act of unfolding God's plan, and what I think is ultimately will be the echo throughout eternity, is that not the song of Moses in the salvation from slavery in Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea, but when we realize in heaven that God has conclusively, for all time, for all eternity, drowned our sins in the depths of his son's blood. And he has redeemed us. And we are there in heaven with him. We sing the song of the Lamb. And we proclaim his name. He makes his name known. That's the entire business of what we're all about. And so what we see then throughout scripture is that yes, God makes his name known. But he is also eager when that name is challenged to be protective of his name. This brings in a concept that I think we're very familiar with. We have this idea of holy versus profane. The idea of holiness throughout the scripture. Holiness is the quality of the summation of God's incomparable qualities. That is, when I finally grasp... God is like no one, like nothing else. Because of all of his qualities together, he is not like anyone. He's incomparable. That quality, that realization has touched upon his holiness. Profane then, or that which is profane, or profanity then by definition, is treating what is holy as if it were common, or as if it were just simply one of many in a set. And so then, we see throughout the scripture that God acts to confirm his holiness, and when he has detected that his people or others are losing their grip on understanding who his name, what his name is, he is jealous and eager to protect it from profanity. If you will turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 20. There are some comments that our God makes in this chapter that should really make all of us sit up and pay close attention to understanding God's approach to his name. Ezekiel chapter 20, the aim of the prophet in this chapter is to impress upon the Jews, both in captivity and in Jerusalem, you are in the process of making the same rebellious mistakes that your forefathers did when they were in Egypt and in the wilderness. When are you going to change? That's the point that Ezekiel is making. And in chapter 20, notice how God is trying to impress this upon them in verse 5. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them saying, I am the Lord your God. So again, the idea is that God has taken the stance of someone whose name and whose testimony is scrutinized. And God says, even I myself raised my hand and I took an oath and I said, I'm making myself known to you. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord God. But in verse 7, then I said to them, each of you, Throw away the abominations which are before his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not obey me. They did not at all cast away the abominations which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And we can keep on reading, but the same pattern is established. And so what we learn here is that even during the period of bondage in Egypt, between Genesis 50 and Exodus 1, the Israelites were worshiping the gods of Egypt. They were worshiping idols. Is there any wonder then that God was waiting then? 
And that then explains part of the chastisement of the slavery in Egypt. The Israelites were idolaters in that period of time. And what God is saying to the people, he's pulling back the curtains of his divine thought. And he said, they deserve punishment. They deserve to be wiped out and snuffed out there in Egypt. But he says, I acted for my namesake. Because what God expresses here is, I didn't want the Egyptians and I didn't want the others to say, oh, it's because he couldn't bring them out of Egypt. It's because he couldn't train a people to be his own that he did it. God says, none of that, none of those accusations would make it true. But I want to cut that off and I want to establish my name. And so we see this phrase, this phrase, not only in Ezekiel, but throughout the scriptures, for my name's sake, for the sake of God's reputation, does he act. So if God acts in such a way to safeguard his reputation and his name, then what about me? And that's what we want to consider then as we start to close this lesson up, how we affect God's name. What do I do to contribute or to detract from the name of God? Well, one would be how I speak about God. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20, we see in the Ten Commandments, the third commandment that I think all of us well know. In Exodus chapter 20, notice verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Like so many of, of the other commands, there is a general commandment. And there are many specific practical applications of that commandment. The general commandment is this. It goes beyond not saying God and not meaning it. That's a specific. What's the general principle God is establishing? God is saying to the Israelites with this third commandment, I have affirmed my name. You now know who I am. Never act in such a way that you bring a reproach or detract from my name. And do not go around taking up, I'm an Israelite, Jehovah is my God, and then not acting like it. You treat my name with all the reverence and all the significance that it has deserved. Now then, what are specifics of that? When he says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The word take here appears often throughout the Old Testament. The basic idea behind this verb is to bear, to carry, to lift up. It can be used to mean lift up my head and look up, to lift up my eyes, to lift up my foot to go walk somewhere. It was related to the word for the person who carries the shield or the armor for a king or a champion. The armor bearer. That is to say, we are to be the name bearers or carriers of God. And do that in a responsible, godly way is the commandment. But there's also a use of this word to take the name of a God or to take the name of someone... And this is to use it in an oath or to use it in some kind of specific meaning. That I am attaching what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do. And just as surely as the God that I'm invoking exists and is true. So what I'm saying or what I'm about to do is true as well. He's telling his people, if you use my name and my credibility to establish your own, you mean it. And you use that purposefully. Do we still need that lesson today? How often at the store, in work, at school, sometimes in our extended families, in text, online, in entertainment, do you see God's name taken in such a way that has no concern or no awareness of his name? It's not just if you say the word God or Jesus and are not thinking of him, well, that's a bad thing that you've done. Go beyond that and realize that I am adopting his reputation and his name and I am profaning it. 
I'm treating it as common. To say things like, oh my God, and not mean it like they do in the scriptures is a serious sin. Because I am taking this concept of possessing and owning my relationship with God as the most precious thing that I am and have. But I'm just going to treat that as a common thing. If the Israelites were struck dead for touching the wooden and golden ark of God, an object, what greater punishment do you suppose worthy for those who take the holy reputation and name of God and use that in a common way? To use the name Jesus or the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and just exclaiming or as a filler or to express excitement breaks the command and the will of our God. And it treats his name as common. There's another way in which we can think that we're avoiding doing that by doing the same thing ultimately. There's something that's called a euphemism. And I think most of us who are of any age at all understand what a euphemism is. And for those who might be a little bit younger, a euphemism is when you want to express something, but if you said it very directly and plainly, it would be considered rude or inappropriate for whatever reason. So you say a softer or nicer sounding version of it. As an example, you don't want to say so-and-so died. You don't want to say that, so you say they passed away. That would be a euphemism. It's a softer way of expressing it. There are euphemisms for that which is holy that are very common. We don't want to say the name God, so we just jumble the letters around a little bit or, or mess with that a little bit. And we might say, gosh, or golly. Or we take a trait of God expressed in the Bible as synonymous with himself and put that in place of saying, oh my God. Oh my gracious, oh my goodness, these are euphemisms for the holy name of God. Or abbreviating the name of Jesus to G's or G or the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to say ghost or spirit, so I'll say something common like smoke, cow. We don't realize it, but we are taking the name and the reputation of God and who he is, and we're dragging it down to something that's common and something that's unclean. And we as God's people who wear the name Christ and being identified as a Christian need to take that with the greatest seriousness. And abbreviating it in a text to OMG is no different. We need to be aware of what I am doing and how I'm treating the name of the God who has saved me from eternal damnation. And has given me a chance of eternal life. I need to take that with great seriousness. And someone will say, and they'll say it sincerely, well, I don't mean that. I don't mean to be disrespectful. That's part of the entire point, is that it is thoughtless. It is not intentional. And that's the great danger behind this, is that it can lead to a general casualness with our God's reputation. Let's all of us be very careful about how we use our God's name. But we can also profane the name of God in our worship. The Israelites had this problem. Let's turn over to Malachi chapter 1. I don't want to belabor this point right now. I just want to say and use this to underline and exclamate the excellent thoughts that Bryant shared with us this morning. One of the points that he made is that when we show reverence, not just in the Lord's Supper, but we can apply his appropriate thoughts for anything we do in worship. As, as Bryant noted, if we're whispering or writing notes or if we're just thinking about whatever we want to think about or, or doing these things during worship, we are profaning the name of God. The Israelites had this problem. If you look in the book of Malachi, chapter 1 and verse 6, God asked the question to the people. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offered defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? 
by saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? What God is saying is because of your worship, you are telling me and you're telling others that God of hosts is not important and he's lower in rank than just a mere human official. And so God then is looking forward to a time in which he will have a true spiritually refined people who take seriously his name. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what does the opposite of this look like then? What does it look like in a worship context beyond just offering my best? What does it look like to honor the name of God? That's why we have Psalm 66 up here. Let's turn over to Psalm 66, and we won't read the entire psalm, although probably after this morning you'll want to. But I want to look at a few points from Psalm 66 on what it means to glorify the name of God. If you look in Psalm 66 and verse 1, the psalmist writes, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Now, here we've seen just a general acclamation that God's name is worthy to be praised. And I want to do it. I want to glorify your name. I want to sing praises to your name. But so far in the psalm, we're not told how you do that. Have you ever thought, how do I glorify God's name? What does it mean to praise him? Does it just mean saying, I praise God? Was that praise of him just then? It could be. But the psalm here explains and he gives a how-to of what it means to glorify or that is shine a light on the name of God. Look in verse 5. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Can we break there for a minute? That is how you praise the name of God. That's how you praise and how you really bring attention to anyone. If you were to praise and if you were to congratulate and compliment an athlete... What do you talk about? Do you remember the time when in the fourth quarter they threw this pass? Or do you remember when they set this world record in terrible conditions? In all of this political unrest? Do you remember that? Or do you remember the time when they did this or that? You talk about what the athlete did. If you want to praise or glorify a politician, you might talk about the laws they passed, the measures they passed, the kinds of executive clarity of thought they expressed in difficult trying times. You might talk about what they did. If you want to praise someone who sews well or who cooks well or does anything like that, say, I remember the time I tasted this or the time you made this and it was so beautiful. You praise their works. And the works point toward the one who authored them and did them. We praise God by reminding ourselves and by proclaiming and announcing to one another and to others. You remember what God did here? You remember what he did back there at the Red Sea? You remember what he did when Sennacherib surrounded Jerusalem? You remember what he did when he brought the Jews back? And in great trials and obstacles they rebuilt the city, rebuilt the temple? You remember the cross? You remember the great day of Pentecost? You go through the works of the Lord. And if you go back and you actually read Acts chapter 2, when the Jews were hearing in tongues, in languages that the apostles had never studied, what were they hearing before Peter's sermon? They were hearing them, each in his own language, proclaim the wonderful works of God. They were announcing the Lord's name. That's how we praise him, and that's what worship is at its heart. That's the beauty of our songs. 
We sing these things to praise his name, to remind each and every one of us of his reputation and what he has done. I glorify God when I worship in a way that acknowledges his name. I want to make a third and final point here this morning. The hypocrisy or the sincerity of my life as a Christian profanes or honors his name. Yeah, I'm turning over to Titus chapter 2, and there's a, a phrase found here that I want to focus on and I think is very memorable for our point here. In chapter 2, Paul has been explaining to Titus what he needs to teach different groups of Christians and their specific needs, what they have to be. And in chapter 2, he turns in verse 9 to bondservants. There's a phrase he uses here that's true about all of us as his people. So notice here Titus 2 and verse 9. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. I think most translations and versions will say adorn. What does it mean to adorn something? Well, it's what it might look like if a woman puts on makeup or a string of pearls. She's adorning herself. Or for a man to kind of clean up, press a shirt, try and put on his best impression, he's adorning himself. Or we might adorn a house, or we might adorn something to decorate it and to beautify it. It's to draw attention and to draw attention to beauty, to make it beautiful, to make it attractive. To think that God would allow you and me to adorn the doctrine of his son. That by my actions, whether as a servant or in any capacity as a child of God, when I live sincerely, I can't be perfect. And when we talk about sincerity versus hypocrisy, we're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about, you know, you know sometimes I fail, sometimes I'm weak. That's not hypocrisy to acknowledge that. What we're talking about is when I sincerely acknowledge I'm not a perfect person, but I'm trying to walk along the path of the Lord, and I adorn His doctrine... I glorify God, but to be baldly something that I don't profess to be. When I profess to be a child of God, and yet in my attitudes and in my actions, that is obviously the furthest thing from my mind. What do other people think about that? That must not be much of a God. That must not be much of a Bible or of a book that it can't bring any authority on this person's life or that it means nothing to them. My life can honor or can profane the name of God. Closing thoughts to you. If it's God's concern about his name, that should be my concern. Why is God concerned about his name? Have you thought about that? Nothing we do affects God's character or his nature. Even if all of mankind turned away from the Lord, that doesn't impact who he is. That hasn't damaged him in any kind of way. So why is God concerned about his name? Why does he do things for his name's sake? Why does he want his children to prioritize his name's sake? It's for the good of us. It's for our spiritual interests that we're concerned about God's name. God wants to draw us and others to him by his just and merciful and loving character. And insofar as I fail to acknowledge his name or others do, that is to our spiritual detriment. And that's why God is concerned for his name's sake, to draw us to him and his wonderful character. And this then is our God's concern and it should be ours. And I think with great cause then, Jesus taught us to begin our prayers in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Is when I communicate with God, what is first and foremost on my mind before I get to anything else. Lord, your name is established in the heavens for all eternity. May I act like it. May I contribute to it. And all that I now am praying for, am thankful for, all that I'm living for is to advance your name. And for your name's sake. It reminds me also 
of another passage that we'll close with. It reminds me of what Paul was teaching the Philippians about having the mind of Christ. And remember at the very end of that section, he said, Because of Christ's humiliation and his servitude, God has highly exalted him and done what? And given him the name which is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that all tongues will confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will come a final day in which God's name, conclusively for all time, for all humanity, will be set forth in crystal clarity. And what God is now calling upon me is in this life, now while I have the time, live as his name is precious and reverent to me. And there will come a time in which all humanity, willingly or unwillingly, will proclaim the name of Jesus. But those who have done it willingly in this life will receive the reward of continuing to do it in heaven for those who have not willingly confessed the name of Christ in this life. Their condemnation will be they will be shut off from the name of God for all eternity. The choice is yours and it's mine. And if you choose this morning to come to him and you wish to confess his name, confess his name before this assembly, we will witness this morning your immersion in water in his name. And you can live then for his name's sake. And if as a child of God, if there's any way that we could pray for you and encourage you and know in future days how we can be of assistance to you, that's also an invitation to you to make that known. If we can help you make your life right with God, Make that known while we stand and sing together.